Hi, I'm Daryl Cagle, and this is the Cagle Cast, where we're all about political cartoons. I'm going to describe the cartoons to everybody, but if you want to get the video podcast, go to Cagle.com or Apple Podcasts or YouTube or Spotify. You can see the cartoons as you listen to this. Today, we are talking to editorial cartoonist Jeff Katurba, and we're going to look at a whole bunch of Jeff's cartoons. Jeff was the editorial cartoonist at the big newspaper in Omaha, Nebraska, that will remain unnamed for over 30 years. And Kegel Cartoons, our syndicate, syndicates Jeff to newspapers everywhere. Jeff's original drawings have flown aboard the space shuttle Discovery. He does TED Talks. He gives talks on creativity and living with Tourette syndrome. He wrote a popular memoir titled Inklings, a powerful and moving portrait of an artist. He's the lead singer in a swing and jump blues band called the Prairie Cats, and he's incredibly popular among editors in syndication. Really standing out by far from the other artists in our syndication package in terms of his popularity with editors and the amount that his cartoons get reprinted. That newspaper in Nebraska that we are not naming is kind of crashing and burning and laying people off like most newspapers are now. And they laid Jeff off too. And we're doing a crowdfunding campaign to try to keep Jeff drawing his great cartoons now that he doesn't have his job. I would hope that you will all visit Jeff's crowdfunding page at kegel.com slash Katurba. And um, anything you can do to keep Jeff in the public debate would be great. This is this an important moderate voice not to lose? In fact, Moderate voices are really pretty rare among cartoonists and among everybody in the public debate these extreme days. It's very interesting that there are any moderate cartoonists. There are certainly very few. You're a rare one, Jeff. Uh, we're going to look at a whole bunch of Jeff's recent cartoons and uh, welcome, Jeff. Well, thank you very, thank you very much, Daryl. Thanks for that uh, wonderful uh, intro. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I am delighted to have you here, and I want to get you to talk about yourself and and all about what you're doing and how things changed for you now that you've left the newspaper, you're just drawing for syndication, and what's up with this crowdfunding campaign. Tell us a bunch of stuff. Yeah, well, thanks for the opportunity, and thanks for having me on. And as you mentioned, I was at the uh, large newspaper in Omaha for over 30 years, something like 12,000 cartoons. And I know that because my mom clipped every single one and has them in binder. <laughs> so she has the, probably the, the largest collection of Caturba cartoons anywhere. Um, and you know, it was quite a shock. It was my, again, my hometown newspaper. I grew up reading this newspaper and I dreamed of one day working there and, uh, it took me, uh, nine years of uh, trial and error in landing the job. And, uh, you know, I did a lot of freelance work and, uh, you know, it wasn't easy taking lots of extra little non-paying gigs. And I finally landed the, landed the job. And then one day these, you know, the outside owners came in and one day they, they called me and I said, you're done. And, you know, no chance to say thank you or goodbye to my, to my readers, um, which is, I know, should add that that is, that's not unusual these days. There's no, just probably a handful of cartoonists left that have jobs at newspapers. And this is just right. the way that the profession has gone. There used to be 40 years ago, there were, about 150, Hundreds. 170 jobs um, in the, you know, in the 70s and 80s. It's ironic that at the same time that these jobs are all disappearing and newspapers are in such decline, I think the work of editorial cartoonists is better than it's ever been. You're certainly doing great work and the cartoons are getting seen. They're getting seen in all kinds of different places. But, you know, the Internet has not uh, developed a culture for paying for content. So our, our clients who actually pay the rent are just these old print clients that are disappearing. So that's the reason for the crowdfunding campaign. We're trying to keep our, our profession, which is more relevant now than ever, alive. And you are just a very important part of it. And you're an unusual cartoonist. Well, I, thank you. Thank you, Daryl. You know, I, when that happened with the newspaper, when they called me, I was hurt in the way it was handled, but I wasn't angry. And I felt liberated, actually, and I do uh, feel that my work has dramatically improved. I'm allowed, able to say, well, whatever I want, really. And I never really had that freedom that I, you know, desired. So that has been a real blessing, actually. Uh, but it, in some ways, it also feels like, you know, I mentioned that it took me several years to land the job, and it feels like I'm kind of back in that place. So it's keeping me young. I feel like I'm back in my 20s, but it's sort of like, 
okay, I need to reinvent myself and what can I do? And it's like, I, I still have this desire to draw cartoons. And as you said, I mean, the world has gone mad, madder than it's ever been probably. And I do feel like, I do believe that it is so vital to have commentary, reasonable commentary, to have journalism. And I think the world now more than ever needs to laugh and to lighten up. But I think cartoons are so relevant more than they ever have been. And so it's, it's the ironic thing is that it is such an exciting time to be drawing editorial cartoons. And I'm grateful for this platform. And, you know, again, anything that folks want to offer to help me keep the lights on uh, or the light bulb flash uh, over my head, I'm grateful. That's great. Can you talk a little bit about being a moderate cartoonist? Because that is so unusual. Yeah, I just find that, um, of course, uh, you know, the first one we see here is a, is a Trump cartoon. But, you know, I, throughout my career... I should add, you know, Trump cartoons just don't get reprinted. And the cartoonists have looking for ways to try to slip Trump cartoons past editors because, uh, uh, you know, that's a great frustration for cartoonists that they really want to draw the Trump cartoons. Well, um, and, let, and, and let me say this about that, uh, as much as I love poking fun. So let me just, cut, you know, talk a little bit about being a moderate. I poke fun at anyone I believe deserves it, any politician, any newsmaker, uh, if I need to point out hypocrisy, if, you know, they're lying about something, if something, if I need to ridicule uh, or satirize someone, I will do it. And I don't care from which side of the aisle they come. I also like to believe, and I do believe this, that I comment and criticize with a sense of humanity. I don't hate people. I want to criticize, but I also want to have that sense of humanity uh, in there. So when I'm drawing, uh, drawing Trump, for example, he's fun to draw and fun to pay, poke fun and deserves it because he's a liar and, uh, you know, and, and he gets what he deserves. And, you know, there's a part of me that, now that, that doesn't sound too moderate. Well, no, it isn't. But I just said, as I just said, as a journalist, as someone who believes in commentary, if someone deserves to be criticized, I will criticize them. And that goes for the current president that goes for a past president. And this has been true throughout my career uh, in, in, in newspapers. And, and I can tell you, there've been times when I, there were times uh, and there still are where, where I am, someone reacts to something or I'll get an email or a phone call or whatever, uh, more phone calls when I was in the newspaper, but I'd get an email uh, and someone will say, you left wing, blah, blah, blah. And then the very next, I swear this has happened, the very next message, you right winger, blah, blah, blah. And I think oh, that has to do with, um, you know, the person, they're bringing their own uh, biases into the, into the conversation, into how they look at a cartoon. So does Trump deserve to be criticized? Yeah. Am I going to draw him every time? No, it's lazy. With all due respect to those, I see some cartoonists with all due respect, some of my friends, but all they do is draw Trump every, all the time, not every day, time, but like, and they'll probably be mad at me for saying this, but it's like, there are, there are so many other things to be commenting on. Partly, we already have a bunch of Trump cartoons out there. We, everybody, there are lots of people criticizing him. So let's look for things that people aren't talking about and looking at, because again, there are so many important things happening in the world. And my one little cartoon about Trump isn't going to make or change anything. Now, this one we're looking at, it's historic. It's absolutely historic. And it's a huge, it is a huge story. Whether you like him or don't like him or whatever, it's a big story. So I felt compelled to draw about it, even if nobody runs it. Yeah, you want your cartoons to be part of the historical record, and you can't ignore these things, even though editors ignore them. Um, right. Well, that's the journalist in me. You know, it needs to be on the record in some fashion. At Kegel, at Kegel Cartoons. <laughs> Tell us about this one. Well, of course, you know, this started as a, you know, more of a, local story, you might say in Florida, I mean, it, it started getting some traction, but I think because of all the things that DeSantis has done and, you know, all the other, uh, pushback against you know, wokeness and whatever else in Florida, the story became a national and international story. And I, I studied fine arts. I've seen the original David. I'm a big fan of Michelangelo <laughs> and my, my goodness really were, were being upset about this is even in the conversation we're having these discussions. Well, this is a very funny cartoon. Well, thanks. And, you know, and I will tell you, just talk about a little bit about the creative process. I spent quite a bit of time. This is a just slap together quickly. I spent quite a bit of time figuring out 
exactly the angle of the state of Florida, how big to make it <laughs> and all of that, because I wanted, you know, I wanted to make it, you know, a little bit provocative, of course, and I wanted to, to have an opinion, but I also wanted to be, you know, uh, something that would be acceptable to run in newspapers and a family newspaper. Well, that's very funny. How about this one? It's, it's just shocking what's happening with, uh, you know, legislation across the country and across the world. Um, you know, I, I do find, you know, as a moderate, I do find that I am commenting more on, on these sorts of social issues because there has been, uh, such a pushback from, from the right. And I, and I'll say the far right, but it's, it's infringing on, you know, on, on the Republican party in general. I mean, not everyone. And again, I'm a moderate, but really for gosh sakes, we don't have other truly and huge issues to worry about in this world. And, and lawmakers are pushing what is clearly discriminatory, uh, legislation down our throats. Uh, it, it's, it's horrific. And offensive to me. So I, yeah, I felt compelled to draw this and well, you know, I'm always looking at grief. It's disappointing to think that this is viewed as a liberal cartoon and uh, a liberal issue. I, you know what, Daryl, you are absolutely right. It's just, it's a human, it's a human issue. Exactly right. And, um, you know, I think that there are those on the right who are showing their colors and, uh, you know, it, it, from the cartoony point of view, I just, I'm always looking for visual elements. I get, I get tired of talking heads and I see those kinds of cartoons, that's fine. If that's what you do, that's all fine. But I'm always looking for some visual element to tell the story, to, to, uh, uh, get to the heart of the matter as quickly and as efficiently as possible using visual elements. And, uh, wanted to show the contrast between th this beautiful rainbow and this, this awful approaching, you know, approaching storm. Very good. You know, I'm, I'm all about kindness and humanity and. I'm just, you know, please people just be kind to one another. And, and that the, some of the legislative, uh, proposals that are proposals that are out there don't seem very kind to me. That is certainly true. So I've got to remember to describe all these cartoons for the audio listeners. Oh, sure. People watching TV and they're looking at a map of the United States where it's got extreme cold in the top and record heat on the bottom. And the husband says, I hate how politically divided this country is. And the wife says, FYI, that's the weather map. You know, cartoonists love to complain about cartoons about the weather. And yet editors just love cartoons about the weather. Well, uh, and, and this yeah, is not really way. about the weather, but it's kind of about the weather. And it, that, that gets the editors to love it. I mean, this one, this one got reprinted a whole lot. I think this was the number one cartoon of the week. I think, I think you're right. And, and for the folks just listening, uh, it's a map of the, the U S maybe you mentioned that, but it's divided in half, extreme cold, blue, extreme record heat, uh, in the South, all red, yeah. you know, it's, it's funny. Like sometimes ideas will just sort of fall into your lap. If you're, uh, you know, as a creative, I'm always aware and I'm listening and trying to keep an open mind to, to all things. And so, yes, first of all, weather is, I always remember for the supermarket. I'm always talking to people. I'm saying, what, you know, at the, gro you know, the person checking out the, you know, my groceries, I'm saying, I bet you're glad that we can at least talk about weather. And they're like, yes, it's the one thing we can all talk about. And it is mostly still the one thing we can talk about unless you get into climate change. And then that's a whole other, other thing. But yeah, you know, I, I put this, this was happening, you know, with this, what this extreme weather and I'm looking at a weather map and I said, oh man, it, the country's like divided. And then you think visually blue for cold, red for, for, uh, you know, hot and, you know, Democrats and Republicans, it just seemed like a perfect visual uh, gag uh, for well, me. Well, it's an and example of one of your, your moderate cartoons and editors do like these <laughs> cartoons that criticize the left and the right equally. Well, yeah. And, and another thing, uh, you know, I've always prided myself in, in my work is I don't want to be predictable. I know some cartoonists on both sides of the aisle pretty much know where they're going to land. Again, great people, great cartoonists, but I, it's there, it's kind of predictable. And I, I want people to know, you know, when, when I'm, when I was working at the local newspaper, uh, you know, I did a lot of local cartoons too, but I, I do that now. I want you to know if you're reading my work, you're not, you're not sure where I'm going to come from on this. And it's not because I'm not, you know, uh, I have a core set of values. I believe in honesty and kindness and, 
uh, you know, doing the right thing. And from that core set of values, that's where I, I work. And, but sometimes I want to mix it up and I want to lighten it up. I don't want to just do hard hitting cartoons about serious things every day. I want to, you know, talk about stuff that's kind of light and stuff that people can engage in. And then the next time, bam, I'll come back with a hard hitting one. And maybe my hope is that they'll maybe take me a little bit more seriously and give me a few more seconds of their time because they'll say, well, that last one, I, I hear this all the time, uh, Daryl, where in fact, I just had a comment, I think it was on Instagram this morning. Someone said, you know what? I, I, I don't, uh, I love most of your work. I didn't care for this particular one on gun control, but I really appreciate most of your work. And I appreciate that. It's honest, even if you disagree. Well, you have a soft sell. It's a way to get some ideas into editors that are resistant to uh, printing any kind of opinion. And you do that very well. I'm very Thanks. impressed with you. Ed. Thanks. Here's a happy Valentine's Day balloon that uh, is a heart, but it is really the Chinese buy balloon. And Cupid is there taking aim and saying, I'm not buying it. But that's very cute. <laughs> Yeah, oh, thanks. I, I, this is just one of those alert to the headlines cartoons. It's Valentine's Day, and this is what's in the news. Well, and, you know, I, I drew that because then there's those other flying objects, UFOs, balloons, who knows what they ended up being, but that was happening that weekend. Uh, and so I drew this uh, as quickly as I could over the weekend, even though I knew that it wouldn't be distributed for syndication until Monday, but I wanted to get it out there into the world because... I, I sensed that maybe someone else would do, you know, a Valentine's related thing. And I, I saw a few others later, but as far as I know, I was the first one to do it. And it's also the first time I ever drew a Mylar balloon. So pretty happy. <laughs> okay, here's mom and the, the kid has his classified documents he's brought home from school. And mom says, and you're certain there's no homework in your backpack. And the kid says, I'm certain, but I did find these classified documents. You know, those, when, when everybody was finding the classified documents in Pence's house and Biden's house, and then we're hearing about how many billion classified documents there are, we got a lot of cartoons about how classified documents are everywhere. And they were really quite popular cartoons. Uh, that's something the editors wanted to see. Well, and it's funny, too, because at first it was just Trump. And then, like you said, uh, well, then Pence, of course, and Biden. And then suddenly, oh, suddenly now it's something we can kind of agree on, it, maybe, that or you know, maybe they shouldn't be classified documents, or if they are, maybe we need to figure out a different, a different system. With this one, I wanted to, uh, I drawn a couple others on the topic, but I want, I wanted to bring this home. Like I sometimes do then I will sometimes draw the politician him or herself in a situation, you know, official, you know, in the white house or something like that. But I also like to occasionally bring it home. Like what is something that, uh, a parent can relate to? Oh, well, a parent can relate to her kid coming home with a messy backpack and forgetting, forgetting the homework. So I wanted to just, you know, tie it together with something that was already relatable, sort of like the weather. I should also say, Jeff, we're seeing editorial cartoons printed smaller and smaller. And mm -hmm. a lot of cartoonists hang on to very rendered styles that don't reproduce very well. And here you've got bright primary colors and thick outlines, and this will reduce really well. Just talking as the editor, um, we get comments like that from editors. Mm -hmm. uh, one comment we get that just kind of surprises me is that uh, they don't like all those brown tones. We want to see primary colors because we're paying for color on the editorial I, page. I, I, uh, I did not. That. Your cartoons are uh, designed very well for the way oh. that they're abused in print. And uh, <laughs> I, 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 that's also a, an element of your success with well. editors. Well, I, I will tell you, Daryl, my work has evolved over the years when I started my job at the local, at the newspaper that shall remain nameless. I was so grateful for this job that it had taken me nine years to get. I gave them every law. I felt it was my obligation to give them as many law. But, and then at some point I realized, well, no, you know, actually a little creative white space goes a long way. And I have become extremely, because I love drawing detail. But yeah, so I'm, I'm really allowing myself the freedom of using you know, using white space. Cartoonists have kind of gained this uh, reputation for cross-hatching. Yeah. Know, when people think of editorial cartoonists, they think of a wide rectangle that's just full of all this fine cross-hatching. And uh, I'm a recovering, I'm a recovering cross-hatcher. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I remember seeing some of your old piece that were rather yeah. cross-hatching. <laughs> they were um, very cross-hatching. 
Well, you know, those were those were the days when they were printed bigger. You could get away with the crosshatchy. And you didn't have color as an option. Yeah, now color's mandatory. Yeah. So here we've got uh, Trump in his golf cart and Biden in his bike. They've both piled high with uh, classified documents. They're being stopped at a classified document check on the road, uh, the road to 2024 by the FBI. This is cute. It's another one of the classified documents are everywhere cartoons. Yeah, well, it's, it's just a fun one to draw. It's also one of those uh, pox on both your houses equally yep. cartoons because you've got both of them the same size stopping at the same line in the road. I would argue that this is not at all equal. Uh, Trump is uh, much worse on the classified documents issue. Well, he has more. He does have more classified documents in his golf cart, and you will notice that he's inch a little closer to the uh, the, the line. <laughs> oh, were you thinking about that, making him to yeah, him closer to the line? Yeah, of course. Ah. Ah. He's not quite running over the FBI agent, but you know. He's, he's well, that's proud. funny. So he's just a couple inches and uh, a few yeah. boxes worse. Yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> okay, here you've got uh, Uncle Sam and the red ceiling is coming down at his head while at the same time politics is sawing a hole in the floor that he's about to drop through. And he says, as if it's not bad enough, we're up against the debt ceiling. The debt, big red debt ceiling. This is cute. This is also not bashing either left or right. It's the whole, everybody suffers from the debt ceiling. Yep. Yep. And I, yeah, I just enjoy drawing it because it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's the, I always think of the old Batman episodes when the, the walls are sort of like squeezing together and I'm picturing the ceiling getting, you know, lower and lower. If I've drawn a saw on the floor uh, cartoon, it's been decades, <laughs> but it was fun to draw. The saw on the floor cartoons, that's a nice cartoonist trope. We rely on these things. You know, in France, they call them uh, cliches. Mm -hmm. We call them metaphors, I guess. I like cliché. They're not really cliches. They are part of our cartoonist toolbox. If you look at the New Yorker magazine, there have probably been a million, obviously overstating that, a million cartoons about people on a deserted island. It just works. It just works. <laughs> okay, here's Jeff Beck. This is a memorial cartoon. You know, memorial cartoons are probably the most popular things that cartoonists can do when, when somebody who is beloved dies. Mm -hmm. Readers in memorial cartoon, they transfer all of their love for that yep. personality onto the cartoonist and you will get more love mail for memorial cartoons than anything else you ever do. That's very true. And this one shows Jeff Beck uh, wonderful, amazing guitar, Jeff Beck taking a, taking a solo. And this is one of those that you might have to just see because it's such a visual, visual, uh, drawing, but, uh, he's sort of, you know, I was playing with this idea that he was a guitar God and, but I didn't want to be so on the nose to say that. And I wanted to sort of infer that kind of, that kind of idea. And so I have him sort of, uh, standing tall, uh, you know, the clouds kind of below him and this starry sky behind him. And there are all these notes coming off the guitar, but they're blending in with the stars, uh, sort of blending together. And you're right. I did get a lot of compliments. I, you know, as a musician, I was a fan. And also, uh, I do think it's, I think it's important to take it. It's like at the, at the Oscars watching, you know, the Academy Awards, or whatever, like they take the, they have the memorial uh, section. And I always, I may not even know half of those people. I always get, uh, I always get a little misty eyed and I think it's important to take, take a moment, you know, take a moment of silence, take a breath, take, take a pause. Think, I think that's very important. We're, the world's crazy. We need to take a, take a breath, even if it is acknowledging someone, honoring someone who's passed away. Well, that's very nice. And here we have Kevin McCarthy. He's whacking himself in the head with his gavel saying winning at the same time, he's kind of, uh, injuring himself. Tell us about this one. Well, you know, this, this. This is just, I, I would have drawn this, uh, I will tell you when, you know, when I was, uh, in the past uh, at the newspaper, I criticized again, everybody from all, all the parties. So had this been a Democrat doing this, you know, doing everything possible, <laughs> including undermining potentially his own authority to get the gavel, I would have drawn the same cartoon and it, he just kept whacking himself, playing whack-a-mole with his, his forehead, just beating his head against a wall kind of thing uh, to gain that gavel, you know, to uh, gain the authority, gain that position. Well, you so. know, our conservative cartoonists didn't draw any cartoons critical of McCarthy. They re draw remarkably few cartoons of Trump because uh, editorial cartooning is kind of a, a negative discipline. Um, 
it's rare that cartoonists have anything positive to say because positive things just don't work that well in, in cartoons. Sure. They work in memorial cartoons. You just see that the conservative cartoonists avoid topics where um, there's any kind of criticism of the right. And uh, liberal cartoonists tend to avoid criticism of liberals. Um, mm -hmm. And you in the middle can criticize left and right. Although you're just showing us some liberal ones here. Well, you know, and honestly, Daryl, I, I was thinking about that. I mean, I think a little bit of that has to do with the culture right now or where, where we are politically. And I think coming out of the, the Trump presidency, I, I will tell you when Trump was elected president day one, inauguration day, did I, was I a fan of his? Did I think he was the best candidate? No, but my basic thing is when you were elected to office and you take office, it's a clean slate. You get day one because people do evolve, people change. And I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. Day one of his presidency, I, I did a cartoon, basically all the, all the people who are criticizing Trump, I said, okay, okay, yes, yes, true, true, true. But he's now the president, take a breath, give him a chance. I caught so much hell from people, from liberals who said, how he's horrible. I said, everybody deserves a chance day one. And, you know, and there were a couple other times when I drew cartoons that, um, I can't remember specifically what they were, but where I, I generally agreed with what Trump was suggesting, you would have thought the world was ending when I was hearing from the left. Having said that, when I criticized Trump, do you think the people on the far right are ever going to say, okay, you have credibility with me because you're criticizing him right now, but you also acknowledge this other good thing that he had done. And I think that that's something for me personally, as a cartoonist. I believe I have more credibility because uh, I am not just going to do the predictable thing. And I think more cartoonists, sorry to my friends, would have more credibility if every once in a while, even if you're on the far right, every once in a while, you might say, okay, do I believe these, say for right now, what's going on with Trump? Do I believe that legally what's happening to Trump, that uh, this indictment should hold and he should go to prison? Do I, do I think that? No, but did what he did, wasn't it? It was pretty sleazy, right? pretty awful, immoral even. If they said something like that, that acknowledged some level of disgust for Trump's behavior, I'd say, okay, now we can actually have a conversation, but there's no conversation because they don't want to have a conversation. And uh, you know, that's the, that's the frustrating thing. So, and that's my, you know, my thing, I just want to get my, get my word out there so we can at least maybe talk about it. I also noticed that there's a whole lot more of these, uh, of, of cartoons about the border crisis from the conservative cartoonists than the liberal cartoonists. Gets to where you just think of any cartoon that even mentions the border crisis is a conservative cartoon just because that's their issue. It's a crisis. And now we can agree to disagree on how it should be handled and how it's fixed, but it's, it's a problem <laughs> clearly. And with this one, we, we see, uh, instead of father time, I did this, uh, over the new year, uh, instead of father time, I'm not, baby, I'm not doing my job of describing oh, the cartoons okay. and you're stepping in. I'll, uh, I'm going to do it. In the, I'm going to do it in the cartoon voice that you do it. Board of very good. No, okay, no, there's no dialogue. This one. <laughs> but instead, it's uh, it's a uh, uh, Statue of Liberty in the in the role of of uh, Father Time, I guess, and uh, and uh, Baby New Year in the in the form of a, a a little girl Statue of Liberty. And I always get tired of all the male dominated imagery, you know. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But the the border crisis, so. Um, Statue of Liberty is carrying the big, um, you know, tablet and it's cracking and it's broken. It says border crisis, handing it off to the baby new year statue of Liberty. Um, you know, because it, you know, it's just kicking the can <laughs> our government just whatever it is, I don't care what side of the aisle, they just can't keep kicking the can down the road. And it's so frustrating. Um, you know, and, and I just really quickly on, you know, uh, talking about male symbols and cartoons, I have experimented with trying to figure out different ways to draw Uncle Sam. Why is it always Uncle Sam? And I've drawn in the past Aunt Sam and other, you know, and other figures. And, uh, Uncle Sam is a, is a little kid. Um, unfortunately, kind of going back to what you're saying about cliches, many readers sort of expect Uncle Sam to look like Uncle Sam. And it's really frustrating because I would really like to push those boundaries and have the cartoon understood. I love the cliches in this one. You're, you're having fun with the cliches. Here you've got two aliens sitting on the moon. They're reading the Crater Courier newspaper about the Artemis mission. One of them says, 
Next, they plan on building a lunar base. And the uh, other one says, let's hope they leave their politics behind. This is another pox on both your houses cartoon. It, it is. And it's also an opportunity for me to draw about aliens. As you mentioned uh, in my intro, I've had a couple of cartoons fly aboard Space Shuttle Discovery. I love all things space. I always have. I am a huge fan of the space program. And so, and I've actually had a UFO close encounter. That's a whole other story. But oh, did they, did they do the, the probe and everything? I don't know. I don't know. I think you don't remember. Ideas. Well, I, 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 I can't say for sure. I can neither confirm nor deny. I don't think so, but I, I don't know. And maybe this little scar on the back of my neck is from an implant, but, uh, but no, I, I love drawing aliens and drawing space stuff and it's just fun. You know, I just, honestly, sometimes, um, I, yeah, the great, wonderful Jeff McNally editorial cartoonist, uh, who also created the comic strip shoe once told me. You know, I was like trying to get some, I was starting out, I was trying to ask him for some advice. And he said, oh, you know, he would say, so I, I just read Popular Mechanics magazine and I'll see a picture of an old truck and, or whatever. I just, you know, he's like, I, I just want to draw a truck that day. He was like, what's the topic? I don't know. I want to draw a truck. I'll figure out a way to work <laughs> it in. So that's fun. Here you've got Uncle Sam, who's quite male here, uh, running after yes. giant inflation, uh, turkey at the Macy's Day Parade it says yep. this year's Thanksgiving Day Parade. That's cute. You know, it's a giant inflatable turkey. Yeah, inflation and it's getting bigger. And uh, Uncle Sam, as a pilgrim, cartoonish pilgrim with his with his little hatchet. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, it's a little double double entendre going on there. The and all, of course, the holiday the cartoons are what the editors really want. We see that coming up on every holiday. They just uh, push out all the other cartoons. If you don't draw Thanksgiving, your cartoon won't get printed. And yeah. uh, also, you're not hitting the left or the right here. There's no. A real opinion, except inflation bad. I mean, there are those who would in, who would uh, blame, you know, uh, Biden, um, which is, I think is a little bit unfair because inflation has impacted the entire world. However, he is the president and it's happening on his watch. And I have drawn other cartoons on Biden and inflation and other topics. Here you've got Elon Musk riding the Twitter bird. He's wearing his space suit. It's going around in crazy direction. And the bird says, so where exactly are we going? Because it's not clear that he's going in any direction with Twitter. Twitter seems like a mess, doesn't it? It, it does, Daryl. And you may be the first person ever to put an actual voice to the Twitter bird. If the uh, Twitter bird had a voice, he would sound like that. This blue check business, it's like they've gone mad. Yeah. All right. Here you've got a Halloween cartoon. And I should say you rock with editors with all of these holiday cartoons. <laughs> and the mom is holding an elephant and a donkey uh, mask for the kid who uh, switches masks when he comes to every place. And the mom says, so the mask you wear depends on the campaign yard signs. And the kid says, yep, if they think I'm on their side, more candy for me, right? It's planned. Well, and it's wearing also a, equal left and right. It is. He's wearing a little, little, little outfit. I heart my party. <laughs> so yes. uh, I love how all my, uh, all my characters, I'm a Midwesterner at heart. I love how all my characters sound like they're from, you know, Brooklyn or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, very good. Uh, here you've got <laughs> Rush Bear with his big broken teeth. Uh, that's another nice uh, cliche. Very good. Yeah, big, big growl and uh, the, yeah, teeth are crumbling out. Here you've got a uh, fella sitting on the grass looking up at the, the big yellow moon and he thinks i forgot how much i missed daydreaming about artemis one yeah that artemis was after the uh, previous artemis launch. one of course is the the lunar yeah now we're looking at Ar artemis two in fact i'm working on a cartoon about that very thing uh the, artemis the, one, the one was unmanned one and artemis two is go around the moon as a test and unmanned but it did have a, a crash test dummy oh here you've got the donkey elephant and eagle looking up at the red versus blue fireworks saying still holding out hope for a splash of purple again pox on both your houses pointing out the divide and and nostalgic too daryl i i mean i get nostalgic for the holidays and for the fourth of july and i like to think when i'm at a for a fireworks display and all those patriotic songs are playing and i'm tearing up singing along next to somebody who i may disagree with but in that moment 
it doesn't matter. In that moment, we are all Americans and we're all just uh, gazing up at these beautiful fireworks. So there's nostalgia and also maybe a little bit of hope. I try to have a little bit of hope all at all times. It's kind of hard to do that, but I try. Very good. Now you're sounding more moderate than you did in the beginning. Okay, here you've got Trump. He's throwing his plate with the ketchup against the Constitution. Well, so much for moderate. Well, I'm saying that I'm operating out of from a journalistic stance. And if someone deserves criticism and deserves for me to poke fun at them, I'm going to do it. It doesn't matter from which side of the aisle they come. It doesn't matter if it's a liberal or a conservative or independent or some other third or fourth, whatever. It doesn't matter. If they're doing something that's wrong, in my eyes, if, if, if I am discerning the truth, capital T, as I see it, then that's my standard. That's my gold standard. That's my, my lighthouse, so to speak. I operate from that. As it should be. Very good. So here you've got the Supreme Court of the United States with a big pipe extruding the sewage. And the political plumber drives by and says, that's way worse than a leak. Of course, they had that leak of their abortion decision that came out early. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a column in the Supreme Court building, I, I one of the you know, Christian columns or whatever curved out and turned into a, and into a drain pipe. And I, I would say that wherever you are on, on that issue, it leak, leaking from the Supreme Court, <laughs> uh, that's not cool. Here is Governor DeSantis, the cat grabbing Mickey Mouse with a visit Florida on his shirt. And DeSantis really has gone crazy with this attacking Disney business. It's Disney. It's Disney. It's, you know, a jillion dollar industry, little cartoon mouse. But. Well, that is true. Here you've got the donkey and Biden going up in the big inflation balloon, Mark 2022. And the donkey says, maybe this isn't the best way to hit the campaign. You see, it's an aerial view. You're sort of up bird's eye view, looking uh, sort of down-ish uh, the balloon and Biden. And then beneath them, you can see farmland. So it's middle America. Maybe it's Iowa. I don't know. Nebraska. But whether it was, it's Biden's fault, whether he can do anything about it, he's the guy in charge. And it, well, I would call this a very stuff. conservative cartoon. You're blaming inflation on Biden and you go both ways. Yep. Here you've got the eagle with political divisiveness on him. And the, he says, an eagle divided cannot fly. It's another, uh, if this is wing versus wing, the right yep. wing and the left wing. And he is uh, pox on both your houses again. Yep. Editors like these equal treatment cartoons. Super hard to draw an eagle with its wings sort of wrapped around. That took a while. <laughs> I think this is your most popular cartoon that you ever drew with us. You've got the lady in the car. This is as COVID is going away from the consciousness so much. And she sees COVID in the rearview mirror. She's got her mask hanging on the mirror. It says year three on the freeway sign. And she says, please stay in the rearview mirror. Please stay in. Yeah, you see this, this giant covid -y, cartoonish COVID thing in the, yeah, in the horizon, sort of like a rising sun. Or some yes, in the rear view mirror. Thing, she's in the rear view mirror. Way. Yeah, this exactly. Is, I can't overemphasize how popular this was. This may have been the most popular cartoon of the year in terms of papers that reprinted it. it I almost didn't do it. Up. It's funny, Daryl. And same thing with the last one with the the eagle with, with the wings. Like sometimes I come up with these ideas, and it's like oh, that's a great idea, but oh, I got to draw that. That's kind of complicated. And when this idea came to me, wait a minute, I'm gonna have a lady in a car. There's a man because that's something we can all relate to. If we didn't do it ourselves, we saw it on rear view mirror. But in the rear view mirror, there's a giant covid -y thing. But then there's a, it sounded really complicated to myself. Like, I'm going to break this down and make it simple. It, you know, pretty proud of how it turned out. So I, but it is complicated. And also here you've got the half of the composition is the dashboard of the car. It, 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 exactly. And I had to do it. Exactly. I had to do it that way to get all those elements in. Uh, you're, sort of, you're sort of like in the, you're a backseat driver. You're sort of sitting in the back, sort of looking over, over her shoulder. Yeah, I had, to, I had to do that because to get the highway sign in, you know, if I drew it straight on from right, right behind her, the, the mask would be blocking the highway sign or something. So it, 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 took, it took a little bit. This one takes, a, takes some planning. Here you've got the skier doing a slalom around the COVID balls at the Olympics. Um, COVID balls. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. This is one of, maybe one of my favorites. It's kind of weaving in and around. Pretty happy with how the snow turned out. And, you know, I remember when, when COVID, the coronavirus, when it first happened, we were like, first of all, I hope this doesn't last more than a couple of weeks. And then, it, then also it was like, well, how do we draw it? And then, you know, those first images of what a COVID ball thing looked like were just ugly. 
And at some point, you know, and I was like, ooh, it's too gross to even draw about or to draw the thing. And then at some point we sort of lightened up and we found this cartoonish symbol. Thank goodness, because I ended up drawing about it. I actually had the world's, as far as I know, the world's first exhibits of cartoons about the pandemic. I had a hundred cartoons and that wasn't even all ones I drew. Oh, I've got to like, say that was a lovely exhibition. You sent me some photographs of it. Wow. That looked great. Thanks. Thanks. So we put it in the, in the shape of a maze of a round maze. So it sort of felt like, you know, you were in, you know, a maze with the pandemic, but I was gr actually grateful because of all the other crappy things that happened on the pandemic. At least, oh, I had this little cartoony ball COVID thing I can put into cartoons. At least at least that. Thank goodness for small favors. So here yeah. you've got the Museum of Current Events, and you've got a big random looking line, red line, and the people watching it, they're saying, clearly it's a gerrymandered district. The lady says, or COVID guidelines. Another lady says, looks like the stock market. Hmm. This is true. Another yep. uh, moderate, neither left nor right cartoon that I am sure did very well. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. Again, I just, you know... I, I sort of enjoy the idea that, that, you know, there might be two people looking at this at the same time who vehemently disagree on all sorts of things, but might be able to look at this, and maybe even chuckle at it. This is a, we can agree to disagree cartoon. Yep. So here you've got Frankenstein's monster, the Soviet Union, and Putin, who is Dr. Frankenstein. Frankenstein's monster says, and you call him Dr. Putinstein. He certainly is trying to bring back the Soviet Union. It's um, Dr. Putinstein. No, I'm kidding. I, I, I drew this before the invasion of, of Ukraine and uh, I'm proud of the drawing. It's kind of weird sometimes when you're proud of a drawing that's about a really serious uh, topic. Um, and I've actually been hit by lightning. So I was pretty happy with the lightning bolt. But that aside, the seriousness of this, I was disturbed, Daryl. I guess I shouldn't have been shocked, but it was disturbing that I received hate mail comments when people who were pro Putin, who didn't see any problem with Russia invading Ukraine or buying into all the lies. I, what, what? And I also, and, this, and you can remind me if this is accurate, I think that a lot of newspapers weren't yet quite sure whether they, they weren't running a lot of cartoons on the topic at first. And it was very clear. But they, they never have run a lot. In fact, it's rare for newspapers to run anything about foreign issues at all. They're introspective on American issues and to my frustration and many of the cartoonists who want to draw oh. about things in Ukraine. Well, because it's important and, and how anyone thinks that this issue isn't a, a, a importance worldwide is they have their head in the sand. It is a lovely cartoon. Thanks. And I think that is our last one. I appreciate the opportunity and I'm grateful to anyone who can offer, you know, support in, in any amount, uh, to help, uh, Keep me in ink, I guess you might say. Keep drawing. I, I do think it's super important. Again, I, I really believe that the world's gone crazy. It probably all, always has been crazy, but I really think that we are sort of in this golden age of, of, of cartooning and it's important. It's important to laugh at ourselves. It's important to satirize and poke fun, but it's also important to support journalism. And I'm a journalist at my core. First and foremost, I am a journalist first and artist second. And I say that with great pride and I think it's just an invaluable uh, thing uh, in the world. We have journalists, thank God, but commentary also is, is a big part of that and reasonable commentary, thoughtful commentary, not hate, uh, commentary that's rooted in truth, capital T, as, as, you know, as I see it, but I'm speaking my truth as I see it and sharing that. Well, there are, there are a couple of things we're trying to do here. First, with these podcasts, I'm trying to get people to get to know the cartoonists, because all too often editors think of cartoons as fungible. They'll get like 20 of them a day and pick which one they want out of the 20. And it's, you know, fungible, like we can get wheat from this barrel or that barrel, but it's all just wheat, no matter where you get it from. They should get to know the cartoonists. And once you know the cartoonists, the, the cartoons make much more sense and have so much more depth. Um, I like mm -hmm. for them to get to know you. And also, well, you know, for a long time, we've done crowdfunding on Kegel.com to get people to support the site because, uh, you know, we don't run ads on the site and, and it's, uh, it's a costly thing to maintain. And, and they've been very good about that. And I decided to change it to uh, being crowdfunding for individual cartoonists because uh, people that get to know the cartoonists support particular cartoonists and they like to support their own point of view. And with 
times being so dire now for the profession, why not let people support what they want to support? If you want to see a moderate voice in the newspaper, support a rare moderate cartoonist. If you're a conservative, well, you will expect you to support a conservative cartoonist. We just had Monty Wolverton, who's quite a liberal cartoonist, and he was supported by very ardent liberal fans. I don't know about moderate fans. We're, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll find out. I'm really hopeful that you do well with this. And it really would be a, a tragedy to, to lose you from the public debate, Jeff, because you are just, oh. you're an important voice and your work is great. And it's popular with the editors. I know it's popular with the readers. And uh, it's just a tragedy that our profession doesn't have an economic basis for survival when it is such an artistically successful mm -hmm. profession. Well, let me just say one thing. I, I do think that there are a lot more sort of independently minded people. And I think there are more and more registered independents. Uh, so I, I sometimes wonder if this divide we keep talking about actually exists to the extent, you know, that it, that it does, you know, I, I mean, I think we tend to hear from the extremes and allowed the loud voices, but I just, my hope that maybe this is, this is just my Midwestern oh, shucks guy here, but my hope is that maybe a lot more of us are more reasonable, uh, and more moderately minded, independently minded than, than we might give ourselves credit for. That's my hope. That's my hope. Well, good luck with your crowdfunding campaign. And again, that is, uh, Kegel.com slash Keturba, as you see here. No better editorial cartoonist to support than Jeff Keturba, and uh, we're all richer for having his uh, voice in the public debate. So thank you for being with us today, Jeff. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. Hey, remember to uh, subscribe to the Kegel Cast wherever you're seeing it. <laughs> subscribe to the Kegel Cast. And our cable cast is available in both video and audio versions. So if you're just listening and you don't see the cartoons, go to kegel.com or Apple Podcasts or YouTube or Spotify to watch the video. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Cyril. And thank you again for your support, Monty Wolverton, the last month, and for your support of Jeff Katrupa in the coming month. And I will see you all soon.